What's up, witches? Welcome to another episode of the Better Witch Podcast, presented by the Modern Witch Network. I'm your host, Allie, aka Bronx Witch. I'm a tarot reader, Reiki healer, and owner of Bronx Witch Headquarters, a conjure shop and witchy workshare space in the Bronx, New York. And I'm going to be coming to you every week with a new topic and perhaps a guest co-host to share our real life experiences and some of the things we've learned along the way as practicing witches. Because when we know better, we witch better. Our guest co-host today is Lilith Dorsey. Lilith hails from many magical traditions, including Afro-Caribbean, Celtic, and indigenous American spirituality. Their traditional education focused on plant science, anthropology, and film at the University of Rhode Island, New York University, and the University of London. And their magical training includes numerous initiations in Santeria, or Lukumi, Haitian voodoo, and New Orleans voodoo. Lilith Dorsey is also a voodoo priestess, editor and publisher of Oshun African Magical Quarterly, filmmaker of the experimental documentary Bodies of Water, and choreographer, performer for jazz legend Dr. John's Night Tripper Voodoo Show. They are proud to be a published black author of numerous titles such as Voodoo and African Traditional Religions, the African American Ritual Cookbook, and the best-selling Orishas, Goddesses, and Voodoo Queens. You can find Lilith on Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter as Lilith Dorsey, and learn more about them at LilithDorsey.com. to say and you know you might have a different view about this but I think it's fair to say that when it comes to uh, magical practices um, and by that I, I just mean either religions or spiritualities that that incorporate what we would call magic or perhaps even witchcraft voodoo is probably one that remains the most mysterious um, and uh, maybe a bit intimidating to folks who are interested in learning more or perhaps feel called to that tradition. Uh, and I think that that has a lot to do with uh, some of the secrecy around the practices. Um, and I think that secrecy is for good reason. Um, in particular, I think we've seen through history that when African practices interact with folks who are not of African descent, those practices can sometimes be taken and changed and altered um, in a way that's really problematic. Uh, and so secrecy around practices helps to protect them from that type of interference. But kind of the downside of that secrecy, I think, is that sometimes it makes practices inaccessible to those who feel like they would like to learn more. And in particular, folks of African descent. I think a lot of us feel like it's a practice that is inaccessible to us because there is so much secrecy um, still surrounding the practices and so much effort is still being made to keep those practices as contained um, as possible. Um, so I kind of want to start there as a person of color in terms of how to fight through some of the misconceptions or misunderstandings that I might have about voodoo that come from the secrecy around it, if that sort of makes sense. I mean, I think that's certainly a problem. The secrecy was for safety for a lot of reasons, not just because, you know, um, outsiders, but for legal reasons, even, you know, there were laws against the practices. There's still a lot of stigma and misinformation. You know, I have a blog, Voodoo Universe, that I think, I know there's over 700 posts. I want to say I've been doing it for seven or eight years now, but even when I started my newsletter back in the early 90s, I was always dedicated to providing accurate and respectful information. And I think that those are two things that they should be like filtered 
filters for people that are out there looking for it. You know, is this somebody who's got no backbone, I guess I'm going to say. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I <laughs> no nickel that. in the quarter, you know, yeah. no verifiable sources or practices or history or connection to the tradition. You know, it's not like other magical practices where I can just pick it up and learn it. You know, like if I don't know how to do a basic altar, there's a hundred different ways I can do it. And and there's sort of a bazillion sources out there. You know, most of them have the basics right. When we look at voodoo, most of them don't have the basics right. You know, we've got people out there that are white Nazis, you know, writing books about voodoo. We've got people that are making stuff up about, you know, their hoodoo heritage. And every time I turn around, I see this happening. And I think that every time somebody uplifts one of those voices, every time a person of color co-signs one of those voices, you're making it harder for the rest of us, you know, that you're just making it harder for the real truth to get out of there. So many times I've heard, you know, black practitioners, BIPOC practitioners say to me that, well, this person's okay, or this person's okay. When I look at them and I'm just like, okay, by who, you know, (laughs) okay, because they took your money and they patted you on the head and they promised to teach you what was stolen from your ancestors for hundreds of years. Like, no, that's not okay. You know? So I think that really going out there and looking, and and there's more now than there was certainly when I started, like I said, back in the 90s. There's certainly more information out there. But even if we look back at somebody like Zora Neale Hurston, you know, some of us were fortunate enough to read some of her work, even in school. You know, it's like this little folklore slice of whatever due to Alice Walker and some of the history surrounding the rediscovery of her grave that we were allowed to find some of this information out there and you know I still hear people don't you know say that she was a voodoo priestess but she was a voodoo priestess you know they've got this eyes are watching God thing in their head and and that's beautiful you know but she was an anthropologist she was the first black female anthropologist in this country you know she studied with Boaz at Columbia the father of anthropology so her efforts to document what was really happening her efforts to make some of the earliest films out there which I had the fortune you know, opportunity to help sort of rediscover and examine in a spiritual light. And now they're available all over the place from the Library of Congress. You know, it's out there. You just have to look, you know, Zora Neale Hurston, Catherine Dunham, people that were trained not only in the practice, but also in the understanding of the way religions and and spiritual practices work and and melding those two things in both art writing, dance, all of these things together. So I think it's just, people have to be more of an active participant, you know, in their own spiritual learning. And they Mm -hmm. have to be respectful as well, because this is, we're talking about a tradition. If we look at somebody like the Orisha Shango from the Ifa Pantheon, he goes back to, I think, I want to say like 400 BCE. So we're talking about 2,500 years of continuous tradition that says this is the way it's done. So I feel like there are a lot of people, and, you know, don't hate me over this, but... (laughs) I won't. I can't speak for anyone else, but I won't. I feel like there are a lot of people that, you know, and I see this especially here in New Orleans, that are black people that are like, you know, give us the information, you know, and and that's not really how it works either, you know, Mm -hmm. because it's a teacher student it's a parent child relationship you join a family you join a spiritual house and you agree to keep up your side of the responsibilities and if everything goes well then hopefully you'll get some of the knowledge that you need maybe not the knowledge you want but the knowledge you need in order to have your best life live your best life that's what all the ATRs are about for me at the core you know yes there's ancestor worship yes there was uh you know an element of resistance to it but when you do divination it's like what's my highest good what's the best life i can possibly achieve under these circumstances we're not all going to be king we're not all going to be you know rich right away right away (laughs) but we can have what we need (laughs) we can have what we need 
Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you what you just said there. There's so many things that I want to get into from from what to expect in terms of voodoo, in terms of finding houses, whether or not that is a, a part of the tradition that is integral, and 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 the, so many nuggets of goodness that I'm going to pull apart um, as we talk. But I wanted to kind of back up a little bit for uh, the practitioner who who is just coming into this and maybe just heard the word voodoo for the first time yesterday. Um, because it did take me a, a while, you know, as an American kid watching movies, you think voodoo is one thing. It's, it's this one image uh, that Hollywood puts forward and it probably will take you a while to even understand that it's, first of all, a diasporic practice and so it has traveled through the world, primarily from Africa here to the West, and it has uh, manifested in different incarnations then along the way. So the first thing to learn, I think, about voodoo might be just that there are different manifestations of it. So can you tell our listener a little bit about the difference between uh, New Orleans voodoo, uh, Haitian voodoo, V-O-D-O-U, and African voodoo? Because and, and maybe I'm missing some variations or something in there, but those are the three that I am I'm aware of and I know that they're very different but I don't necessarily have a grasp on exactly the differences maybe you could help me there sure I mean I do go into great detail in my voodoo book yes. <laughs> in yes, case yes, yes. anybody wants the real in-depth kind of story because it, it is so huge you know mm -hmm. what I mean like it's just such a huge topic and I mentioned my newsletter, the person who used to write my reviews was named John Gray, and he wrote a 600 page annotated bibliography in eight point type. The thing is like this big of, you know, one paragraph each tiny, tiny type of the books that were published up until that point, which I think was the late eighties. So you could spend your whole life just, just researching this and trying to understand it. But when we talk about the practices of voodoo, Primarily, they come from Benin. There's an amazing documentary by John Hansu called In Search of Voodoo, where he goes back to his home country of Benin and talks about the practices there, which incorporate some stuff from the Yoruba people. That's where they practice Ifa. That's where Santeria traditions come from that ended up in Cuba and Puerto Rico and the United States. But since Benin was sort of one of the last ports leaving Africa during the slave trade that a lot of those beliefs got picked up and brought to the U.S., brought to Haiti, brought, you know, throughout the, the world, really, right. and, and continued to travel. So when we look at Benin voodoo, it's got its roots in, it, it's very earth-centered, you know, when we look at almost all of the practices as they're still carried out in Africa. It's about, you know, you don't make an altar in your house. You go to the sacred spot in the woods or by the river right. or where, you know, this natural rock forming is. And that's where you do your devotional. That's where you pray. That's where you, you know, connect with the Orisha or the Loa and the spirits that reside there. Right. So, all right, we've got Benin coming to the U.S. Primarily, a lot of those people went to Haiti and because Haitian independence occurred in the late 1700s. There was, in a way, an isolation that was afforded to Haiti. I mean, they were still had people occupying them and they're still dealing with interference from other countries. But because a lot of those people during the Haitian Revolution, Haitian independence, were practitioners of voodoo, that in that way, that country was allowed to salute voodoo and to still practice and to have it be something that wasn't always seen as bad. It was seen as something that was necessary in order right. to get our freedom, in order to get our independence. Yeah, I've heard many people refer to voodoo as the thing that saved Haiti. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, it's true. And I'm so happy that now, you know, like I said, when I started in the early 90s, people didn't want to talk about these things. And uh, I'm from Brooklyn originally, and I was fortunate enough. I was the Haitian community reporter for this large wow. Haitian newspaper. <laughs> I don't speak Creole. I told them that before I started. They're like, it's right. OK. But okay. what I saw over time was, you know, the older generation still being very scared to talk about 
Vodou still being very hesitant, still making jokes for outsiders, you know, I mean, and, and for people that are watching that, that aren't, you know, black people, yeah. uh, <laughs> very much American black people can be and are considered outsiders to yeah. Caribbean people. And that's just, you know, again, it's one of those things that happens. So I think that, you know, those older generations still hold on to some of those things. But what I saw when I was doing this maybe six, seven years ago was that people were really out about what they practice. People would say, yes, I might have this as I might be a DJ or I might be a dancer or I might be a teacher, but I'm also a mambo priestess. I'm also a hungan. I'm also a master drummer that plays the voodoo rhythms that ceremony. And that's okay. We don't have to hide that anymore. And that's something that I think has really changed, especially in the past five or six years. So that's mm. beautiful. Yeah. And you also have this you know, what you're talking about when you come to the Caribbean or to the US, you also have indigenous people that are there. And in a lot of ways, particularly socioeconomic, that there was blending and, you know, the, your neighbors were indigenous people or the people you work next to were indigenous people. And you were a black person and you might be a free person, but you're still working side by side with these people. Right. So what we see especially a lot of here in New Orleans because it was a French colony, because it was a Spanish colony, because we had the Choctaw and the Chickasaw here in New Orleans that were living and working and, and partying and ritualing with yeah. <laughs> the enslaved Africans that were brought here, that there's much more blending of the traditions in New Orleans voodoo. Right. I think something most people don't know, I didn't even really, you know, fathom the full extent of it, but after the Haitian independence, the population of New Orleans almost doubled. So from Haitians just coming to this city. So obviously we had the religion that we had before that. And then there was a huge influx of people that many of which practiced Haitian Vodou that came to the city in 1800. And then you get the rise of practitioners like Marie Laveau, who is so popular now, <laughs> she was popular yeah. before, but now that she's got this sort of media attention, she's much more popular now. And yeah. uh, You know you're winning if Angela Bassett is picked up to play you. Like, right, you, right. You're win you, you won, <laughs> you Definitely. won the game. <laughs> Definitely, yeah, it's beautiful, it's a beautiful thing. So yeah. I think that, you know, that's, part of the difference, New Orleans, and we have practitioners from all over. There's certainly houses here that are more like a Santo house or a Santeria house. There's practitioners that are straight off the boat from Haiti and set up a Haitian house right here and practice. There are okay. Condomble practitioners. There's, you know, my temple here, I belong to the Guru Spiritual Temple. My priestess there, Priestess Miriam, has her, re her roots in the Spiritualist Church. So there's a lot of Spiritualist things that we incorporate into our practices. Right. We also had two temple drummers that were Cuban Santeros. So there are some sort of Cuban practices that, that in. we incorporate, not in a cultural appropriation way, but in a like, when we started, this person was here and this person was at ritual and this person yeah. was playing these rhythms. Right. And anybody who knows anything about music and New Orleans knows that if it's good, you're gonna drift all over the place and yeah. it's gonna incorporate all those So things. it's become a part of the tradition of the house, you know, yes. the, it's the tradition of the house, which, uh, you know, everybody, I think folks who are experienced with initiatory types of practices know that there's, you know, the sort of the governing philosophy of the community, but then in each individual coven, house, whatever it may be, tribe, uh, it, it becomes like a family. And so there may be elements that each family member brings in that adds a little bit of a different flavor to how that house um, practices and what you are explaining I think for for folks who are maybe scratching their heads sometimes when they are seeing things when we just scratch our heads I know we're both like yeah that. yeah exactly <laughs> um, when folks see uh, voodoo imagery or rituals and then they see uh, Catholic saints or Catholic practices or shamanic practices or things like that what we are seeing is the result of voodoo coming to a new place and getting infused a little bit with the practices of the people that it was touching and and that was touching it and so it kind of you know grows like anything does as it travels and things like that um, 
So that's a, a hallmark to look out for, I would say. I think African, we probably don't see as much, uh, or if any, uh, Catholicism, uh, shamanic practices, Taino practices, and things like that in African voodoo because the practice kind of came this way and didn't practices didn't go back that way. Is that kind of accurate in terms well, of like I mean, what would be is, different? There, there is evidence of people going back, I think, as early as the late 1600s, 1680 or something mm -hmm. like that. <laughs> so I'm like, huh, who were these people that got on a boat and went back to Africa oh to get yeah. ingredients and teach and there? What did, and then and what did they take and how did that impact yeah. what happens yeah. in West Africa? Because I was doing some research on the Benin area. Um, I found out that I uh, have quite a chunk of that. Uh, oh, region nice. in my ancestry, which, you know, that, whew, we'll get into that as a person of color. I'm adopted. I, I'm African-American. So there's all this question mark about where I come from. And so learning that was like, wow, I need to know more. And uh, India spirits are quite an influence in West, in Benin in particular. There are all of these shrines that use images of Shiva and Ganesha and Lakshmi to represent uh, what are Vodou spirits. Um, so you see this interesting way in which tradition changes as it touches new places and new people. Um, and I, I think it's important to understand kind of where these practices come from so you can see how they change and why. Um, and I think that that's really important when it comes to the question of of cultural appropriation, which you touch on, or the idea of taking something and um, meddling with it versus the natural projection of something that evolves over time. Um, and so I think that folks sometimes see practices that are mixes, that have naturally mixed, and think that that means, well, I can do whatever. Yeah, no, I, I think they do and think I, that means. Yeah, I can and do I whatever. think that is, and I can, and I can admit to having that type of confusion where you see something sure. and you're like, oh, okay, well, all right, so there's Catholic saints here and there's this here. Okay, so well, that must mean that we can just kind of mix things up, but then learning the history and realizing, <laughs> ah, no, really, actually, this is what the tradition has become from a natural place. It wasn't because someone said one day, well, I'm going to throw away this that I don't like or this part that I don't like and I'll pick something else and um, so knowing the tr the what's the word the progression of the practice I think helps sure. people maybe to understand why there are those mixes of culture sometimes I mean I think especially with Christianity and this comes back into play when we're talking about Africa I mean if we look at Christianity in the Caribbean and the Americas that the, that was the only religion enslaved people were allowed to have you know, so you couldn't read except for the Bible. You couldn't have a statue except for a Christian one. A lot of times, and they still make them this way, the statues are hollow inside. Right. So you can put your own ritual items up inside there. But when somebody from the outside looks at it, it just looks like the Madonna. The Virgin Mary. You know? right? <laughs> so there is that. And then I think there are some people who genuinely consider themselves to be practitioners of Christianity. I have godchildren in my own house, the house of Mama Brigitte, who are are Christians and they go to church. I had one of my godmothers, Bonnie Devlin, who is now passed. I miss her so much. But um, Bonnie was a UU minister. She was trained at Harvard Divinity, but she was also a master drummer. She trained with Olatunji. She was a girl mambo priestess. She initiated me. And I think that there's definitely space for it to coexist. You know, I, I did not, even though she was also, Bonnie was also a Christian minister, I did not see her blending practices. I remember somebody got possessed once at yoga class when we were in the church. <laughs> <laughs> we had to go do the little blessing for them. It's Ogun's feast day. That's why I'm talking about Bonnie. She was an Ogun. So, and this woman starts barking like a dog. It was crazy. So, wow. <laughs> and it turned out her husband, this was before cell phones, but it turned out her husband was in a major car accident and Ogun has to do with, you know, vehicles and also bloodshed and things like that. So at that moment, it was like the Orisha stepped in, knew that Bonnie was there, knew that we could do the blessing and then her husband would be okay and she'd be okay. Okay, and, and you know, so it's just like 
we wouldn't have made that decision ourselves, and that's part of the reason that you are in a family that you do join a house you know because there's people there that will check you and say hey that's not really how this is done so it's not you you know in this vacuum trying to it's you know birth yourself basically you have to have parents to make sure that you're born and mm -hmm. keep you in check you know and that's not a bad thing it's a good thing yeah 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 i i wanted to talk a little bit about um the difference between uh voodoo and ifa just a little bit um because i think uh there might be a little bit of confusion there um for folks who are new to to voodoo and and how that might be different um because uh, especially because there are some uh, if, and correct me if I'm wrong, but there are some Lua that also show up in the Ifa pantheon as well, or there are some similar names used or things like that that cause a little bit of like overlap. Go ahead, you just go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Let me not even continue to ask this, you know, confusing I mean, question. I think just clear it up. <laughs> I think it's much more complicated than that. People yeah. will say there's, you know, a thousand and one Orisha mm -hmm. because that's as many as you can imagine and add one more. Right. Um, I did mention Ogun because while we're taping this, this is Ogun's feast day. So Ogun is the one that there is some crossover. Mm -hmm. And I think that's because if we look at Dessaline and some of the other leaders of the Haitian revolution, they were actually devotees of Ogun. And uh, from what common accepted perspective is you know again we're not talking about stuff that everything's written down we're talking mm -hmm. about you're correct in saying that each house does its own thing differently but yes ogun does show up i mean for a long time in in nigeria where ifa comes from and is primarily practiced they would have you in court swear on a piece of iron you could take your choice you could swear on a bible or you could swear on a piece of iron uh, I know what I'd be grabbing. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> like, you can believe me this time. <laughs> so there is that. And and there's a lot, you know, you mentioned, you know, Benin. And, and in that documentary I was talking about, they do talk about Ifa. That because, again, you're looking at something that geographically is not that far. So there is mm -hmm. going to be some drift in the practices. There are going to be people that practice both. And um, it's not really a blend. It's more of a separate kind of thing. And... You know, lots of times we even keep the divinities or Orisha or Loa separate. They make special cabinets with doors and walls on them. So like your Orisha will stay in there and they don't have to see that person over there, that yeah. Orisha that they don't like or they don't right. get along with, you yeah. know. So there is this separation of it. And uh, But Ifa, again, is much more nature-based. We've got in Nigeria, we've got the World Heritage Site for Oshun at the river. That's the only protected World Heritage Site for the Orisha anywhere in the entire earth. So uh, that's pretty amazing and pretty fascinating. But, and there, I mentioned before in Africa, you know, a lot of what I've been hearing lately about going on amongst Ifa priests in Nigeria is there's a lot of, it's less blending of Christianity and it's more Christians still considering this uh, a negative, you know, tradition, negative practices and a lot of persecution from Christians against Ifa people. Yeah, yeah, that is really problematic. I'm looking forward to a conversation I'm going to be having later today, actually, with uh, uh, Dec uh, Reverend Valerie Love, who uh, is a Christian witch and has like the, the podcast platform Christian Witches um, and does a lot of talking about the magic and the witchcraft that is in the Bible. And, um, you know, uh, I, I, I think her mission is to, to try to dispel a little bit this idea that Christianity and magic are really uh, you know, totally opposed. Right. I think um, if you are willing to read the Bible with a, a different lens, you start to realize that they really aren't so opposed. But we do still see this mentality by, by many that, um, that Christianity and magical practices just can't go together. And so unfortunately, we do see a lot of, in particular, from Christians in the other direction of, you know, trying to put out these practices and stamp out some of these practices. And that's really sad to see um, because I do think the more you learn about them, the more you realize that the negative things that you may know about them are in fact misconceptions. Um, so I wanted to ask you 
since this is your a, a practice that is close to your own heart and your own life, um, and obviously only what you're willing to share with folks, but maybe you can tell us a little bit about what the practice of voodoo brings to your life and what are some of the beauties of the practice that folks who are not experienced with it or have only gotten misinformation might not realize. Uh, one of my goddaughters, it's actually her birthday tomorrow. Um, and <laughs> she was orphaned at, uh, I want to say she was like, um, right before her 17th birthday, right before she was supposed to start high school, wow. you know, and she had been participating in rituals and knew all the other people in my house. And when her last parent passed away, she fully embraced voodoo because she said it allowed her to still feel like that person was there you know that like we don't see death as an ending their ancestor worship is first last and everything with us mm -hmm. you know they're responsible for us being here they've been through what we've been through even if it's something that we think is extreme like a plague you know right. i think back to my grandmother who told me she cooked dinner for her whole family when she was four years old she made a roast chicken because everybody was sick and i was like wait a minute like you were four years old that was the 1918 plague you know so right. it's like they they've been through these things that we've been through, you know, and we honor them so that can give us their guidance and help us decide where to go. So for me, it was to have that kind of connection to people who have passed. I mean, my own daughter, unfortunately passed. So that's something that's very hard, but I think the practices made it a little easier because I knew that I could still honor her. I could still feel her energy. I could still, you know, we have ancestor ceremonies where we talk about the people that we know that have passed. We talk about my daughter blowing her nose in a wonton pancake because she thought it was a <laughs> tissue. All those memories that you have that just make yeah. you smile about the person who passed, no matter what the circumstances were, that means that they're not here anymore, that they can still be with you in a different way but still be with you and right. still help you and hopefully you can still help them. So that for me, I think is the biggest thing that I get from voodoo. There's also not just a direct ancestral connection, but there's also knowing that everything I learned in history, screw that history, mm -hmm. was not her story. This was not the religion of my grandmothers and their grandmothers and their mm -hmm. grandmothers. They honored deities like mommy water the spirit of water that is like cleansing and ever present in our mind and in our bodies in the earth in the sky all of these things and that allows me to connect with something that i feel like is deeper and it's also much more effective than i feel like christianity ever was i mean no offense to the christians out there but um, <laughs> yeah, no. i think now is a good time for a break for me, uh, just as a person, to be able to look at something critically and, and analytical, especially something that I grew up with. I grew up in a very Christian household, and, and uh, my family's very Christian to this day, lots of reverends and pastors and all of that stuff. And um, I, it feels really good to reach this point where I'm able to look at something like Christianity with a critical eye and say, hey, I can see the beauty in it. Um, and uh, the, the significance and the importance of it. Because at the end of the day, um, even if Christianity doesn't necessarily hold some of the power that other practices have for me, 
It is still the religion that many of my ancestors relied on during the most difficult times of their lives, right? So the first West Africans who were here, who had not yet been indoctrinated into Christianity, maybe not so much, but for my more recent ancestors, it's Jesus all day. And, and, and he is the reason they were able to survive any thing. Um, so it, it feels good to reach this point where I'm able to look at it critically and understand that it plays a important role in a lot of people's lives, especially American people of color. Um, but that there are also great beauties and powers in the practices that we had before that. And um, that it's important, I think, to, to learn that, to dispel some of that and have a deeper understanding of of the fabric of who we are, because if we're only focused on, you know, the last 400 years or what happened with the last grandparent or great grandparent, we kind of lose a part of ourselves because there's a big piece of who we are before we came to the Western world um, that has been kept from us. And there's a lot of power in that. And I think practices, I would say I know, but to be cautious, I'll say I think I think practices like voodoo really help people of color to see themselves as more than just products of slavery and Christian Americans. No, sure. And I think we can certainly I, I feel like I have to say this right now. You know, we yeah. can all Wakanda forever. So yes. <laughs> Which is also a, a Santeria salute, a Lafia. And I didn't realize it once till I was on a bus in New York City and somebody had their Aliques, their Santeria necklaces on. And I saw them and I was like, a Lafia. And everyone on the bus turned around like we were, you know, from Wakanda. So yeah. to me, <laughs> I think that, but that movie allowed us to see things like the Dahomey warrior women, you know, like if I had grown up knowing that there was a whole warrior class, you know, among the Dahomey, and again, if we look at the Dahomey people, that is the Benin region. That is where we're talking about these people coming from, that same general area of West Africa. That feminine power was something that they knew and they lived by and it protected them and they all saluted it, you know, and to grow up in this sort of post sixties atmosphere that I was young in where people were just like, oh, well, you know, I, I wish black is beautiful. We could all sing that, but no, that was in response to hundreds and hundreds of years of oppression. And it's mm -hmm. still, even now is not the best thing to be, you know, black and a woman Poor Nina Simone and me and you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right? It's still not that easy. You know, it's still not that easy. And for me, anything that we can do to reclaim that. I'm not saying you gotta go run out and set up some sort of weird, strange shrine or anything like that, but just the understanding of this is what's happened, the understanding that this is knowledge that was suppressed and not for our own good. Right, right, and I think that that is something that is not included in, in mainstream depictions of voodoo, and I feel like it maybe is purposeful, but you don't necessarily hear so much about how important the divine feminine is in voodoo. And I think that's really important. So I think that Christianity gives us this very masculine model of like what God is and, and the, you know, really kind of takes care of the patriarchy and supports and justifies it. And I think folks that first step outside of Christianity, one of the first things that we do, especially women, is we look for practices where the goddess is honored, or we look for practices where a strong feminine roles exist. And I think uh, many of us go towards practices like Wicca because the feminine divine is very sure. much emphasized there and that's really readily accessible. And I think you don't necessarily know upon first glan glance that the divine feminine is so honored and important important in, uh, in, in the African religions, but in, in voodoo in particular. Um, can you talk a little bit about the divine feminine in voodoo and, and like her role and importance and maybe some of the lua or energies that someone might want to educate themselves about if they are looking for a practice that honors the feminine? Yeah, I think we are definitely talking about Mami Wada, who I mentioned before, who's sort of this everywhere that water is present, you have Mami Wada. And this sort of double-tailed mermaid, no, it's not the Starbucks image, that was the image for Mami Wada for, again, hundreds of years, right. you know, goes back to at least the 1700s, probably before. And so we're looking at this kind of honoring the water and ourselves and the planet, all of these things. And then also Nanambalaklu, 
who is, and her feast day is coming up too. She is seen as the mother of Obaluaye. She is seen as sort of the sort of primal grandmother healer that you get in the Ifa tradition. I love the fact that she's sort of, you know, covered in straw and purple, and she almost never talks. I had a beautiful conversation with a friend of mine who's a Babalawa or a Ifa priest uh, not too long ago, and we were talking about it, and we think maybe the reason that she almost never talks is because she predates language. So it's like this ancient ancestral you know intuition you know people talk about feminine intuition things like that but in the in the way that she communicates is almost on the vibe of feminine intuition she doesn't need words she gives you the feeling she gives you the action to take from that feeling so those are two of the most beautiful things that i think of mm -hmm. and i i also think that voodoo specifically that was beautiful that you asked me that question is unique to honoring the women in the sense of we have voodoo queens we have mambo priestess is not that you don't also need that male component and yes most houses do have both of those together but i think just because of circumstance or because of who the people were you do get this prioritization of female leaders in the community that you don't get even in santeria because it does have that machismo that's attached to that culture coming from you know cuba and puerto rico and, and things like that so uniquely that women are afforded a special place as the role of queens, as the role of people who could teach the children and the next generation and the next generation and the next generation. You know, they thought they were giving us the crap job by putting us in charge of the children. Little did they know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's how you get the next generation to learn the yes. right way, right? That's mm -hmm. important. They always, I have heard it say by um, sociologists that it's, it's women in the culture that tend to keep things like language, um, cult, uh, food, dance, uh, religion alive because oftentimes when, when families move to other places, they immigrate to other places, it may be the male of the family who goes out into the workplace and therefore has to quickly assimilate to English or another language or drop their cultural practices, you know, put on a suit or what have you and, and go and do that while the woman is perhaps still at home with the children and able to teach the, the home language, able to show how we cook the foods of our people, et cetera, et cetera. So women really play a super important role in keeping culture alive. Um, through the transits of our lives that we might take or changes in, in geography and they help to disseminate these practices as well by carrying them with them and I just got the image of African women burying rice seeds in their hair yeah. to, to smuggle with them you know we carry this stuff with us and um, I think for a lot of people that are leaving the church or uh, some of these more uh, patriarchal practices uh, they are naturally drawn to practices where the power of the di of the divine feminine and the power of, of the woman in the role uh, of culture is important um, and in the practice. And I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about the structure of voodoo because you mentioned mambos and hungans and these might be terms that people aren't familiar with. Um, we are probably all familiar with the term babalawo because if you haven't had one in your DMs yet, then you're not <laughs> online enough. You might want to increase your social media engagement because uh, if you haven't had that happen yet, then where are you? Um, so we might be familiar with the term babalawo, but a little bit less familiar with mambo and hungan and maybe how uh, voodoo houses are structured. Uh, so we kind of know what to look for or what to expect. Okay. Well, I guess the first thing would be, you know, when you go in and you join the house in a voodoo house or a voodoo house, the first thing that's going to happen is you're going to have a head washing. In Creole, it's a lave tete, so literally wash head. Mm -hmm. And that's going to make you able to recognize the loa when you see them, and then the loa can recognize you. So for everybody out there who had a dream about or Zuli or some sort of, you know, I did a meditation and she came to, that's beautiful, and but that's not how it's done. I mean, I felt a little, you know, ego damaged myself when I got <laughs> to the door and they're like, what? Like, right. I had this great thing. Uh, you know, that's nice, sweetie, you know, and you get a pat on the head because you're not through the door yet. and. You need to have that kind of cleansing just to get through the door. So once you do that, then you can go through the door. You'll have a lot more clarity afterwards. Things will be a lot, not necessarily simpler, but you'll hear what you need to hear as opposed to just noise. Mm -hmm. 
and hopefully you'll take positive action from those things. So once you've done that in a Haitian house, you usually have various levels of Kanzo initiations, which uh, at that point you're a Hunsi, and depending on different houses, they have different levels of Hunsi, but that's sort of like an assistant or a junior kind of priest okay. or priestess mm -hmm. who are like, you're there, you've started your initiations, you're right. like the helper you kind help of thing. With stuff, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And then eventually, if you're supposed to, not everybody's supposed to keep going. It's, it's not like Wicca in that way. Not everybody's able to necessarily go to the furthest initiation that they can get. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not just a matter of wanting to do it. My priestess used to say, I don't initiate anybody who wants it because they don't understand what it takes to do right. that. They don't understand that it's it's not fun and games it's not all pretty clothes or or whatever you know so but eventually you know the mambo and the hungan will lead their own home for or spiritual house that's what you call it in um haiti okay wow and what um what is the process like of being a hunsi is it uh is each house sort of different or is there sort of a a, a a syllabus, if you will, of the no, there's no syllabus, learn. there's no textbook, there's no commonality between the practices. I mean, Milo Rigaud, who has written several books about voodoo, he was an anthropo French anthropologist in the 40s and 50s and 60s, and he sent out all of his little students to go find out, like, okay, what loa is worshipped at this temple, what loa is worshipped mm -hmm. at this house, you know, and they found hundreds of different ones, each one was different, each one had its own unique practices, its own veves, its own food, its own offering, its own drum rhythms, its own music, its own dance, its own songs, all of those prayers, all of those things were unique to that house. And, you know, in Haiti, traditionally, it would be you join the house that your family was in. So it was your blood family in addition to your spiritual family. Right. Now, obviously, because the world is, is bigger and not necessarily along those lines anymore, people still join a house but it's not necessarily blood family. It's not necessarily, you know, but then you do join the house and then that gives you the direction as to how you move forward. So they'll tell you how to make the ritual foods. They'll tell you all of those things. You know, I mean, being a Hunsi, you certainly do have an obligation to the house. So if there's a feast day, as I mentioned, today's one, we had one last week, you know, you're required to show up, you're required to help with the ceremony. That means money, that means work, that means time that means all of those things okay and something that I was talking to Thorne Mooney uh, she is a, a Wiccan high priestess and she uh, know, writes Thorne. yeah uh, <laughs> so you know she writes quite a bit about uh, coven life from the Wiccan perspective and um, we were kind of talking a little bit about whether or not a coven is a place where you get education on the practice um, or is it more social and things like that so it sounds like to me a voodoo house is is a place where you would actually learn the practice there will be elders and folks there who will teach you things like how to participate in ritual how to cook certain foods and things like that it's more than i mean it won't social gathering. it's both it's both really because it's not like you're going to go to you know the home for and you're going to sit down in a chair and they're going to explain what they're doing like but they're going to do it <laughs> and you got to help do it so you better watch what happens because you may need to do it maybe not that year but next year or the year after you know so just the mere fact of coming together and doing it and it really is a family oh look we got a storm it really is yeah, a we're about to have one here too that that, that ambiance was great that sounds <laughs> No, but I mean, if if your you know god sister or god brother is sick, and we all have to come together to do a healing, then you really you bond with that person, you bond with the people around that person, you know. Or if you're coming together to celebrate as a thank you because maybe they got healed from their sickness, or maybe they just got a new house or whatever, it really is a family, you know. And uh, I think that's one of the challenges I've had running my own house. I, I think we've got maybe I don't know, probably 10, 15 active members right now. But one of the challenges is keeping it together through the pandemic, you know, through a move, all of these things. I've yeah. got children all over the world now, you know, so getting together and being able to be a family is really hard. But it's so important because how are people going to learn, you know? Yeah. And 
in this world, we have the internet and we're grateful for it. It allows us to do things like this, um, but it, it sounds like the house experience really is one that happens primarily in person. Is that something you would say if folks are interested in learning more about a voodoo house is, uh, and there isn't one near them, should they just throw up their hands and say, I can't do anything about it? Or is there a way to get in? I mean, I traveled a thousand miles to come see my godmother. <laughs> That's why I finally moved to New Orleans because I was coming down here to see Priestess Miriam four or five times a year. And I was like, well, she's 79 now, so. <laughs> Why don't I just go down there? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe so I should just move there and right. then I can help easier. You know, I've got, I had God kids here last month. I have more coming down from New York in a couple of weeks, you know, so it, it's, you're choosing your parents. You're choosing people who are going to care for you. You're choosing people who you have to trust a hundred percent. So yeah, maybe it's not going to be the person that's around the corner. You know, I mentioned my godmother, Bonnie Devlin, that was a miracle <laughs> that I was living in this tiny town in New England. And then they called me up and I was teaching tarot at the UU church. And they said, we got you a new minister and she's a Haitian mambo. That's not going to happen for any, everybody. And I'm surprised it happened for me. I wanted it to happen 10 years earlier, but it yeah. happened when it happened. Right. So, and so you might need to go and travel. You might need to go and book a reading. You might need to go and, you know, you hear there's an, we just did a giant open ceremony in Congo Square and somebody's like, oh, I'm coming next year. And I was like, dude, this was a once in a lifetime thing, man. Yeah. Like, yeah, we don't have it. open ceremonies that often. It's not, yeah. we ain't running out there trying to look for members. That's not yeah. happening. Yeah, so that's actually a good point because that is something that's different. As Thorne and I were talking about how it is very common um, for Wiccan covens or communities to have, uh, whether they be open ceremonies or like Sabbath um, uh, rituals and things like that, um, where the, the, the general public are invited and obviously there's stuff that goes on that the public is not invited to, but the idea is these public gatherings are a way for folks to interact with the coven in a casual setting, uh, you know, maybe joining for a solstice party or something like that, um, and then getting to know folks before deciding whether or not they want to move to the next step, which in a lot of Wiccan covens is the dedicant level, where you're expressing an interest and you're perhaps attending uh, some rituals and maybe assisting in some way, but you haven't yet gotten to the level of initiating into the coven. Uh, but it sounds like voodoo houses don't necessarily have open uh, ceremonies and things like that. So if someone um, is interested in pursuing learning more about voodoo or finding a house for themselves, uh, perhaps they had, like me, had a discovery of their ancestry or um, they are having dreams that they can't interpret or spirits seem to be communicating with them, but they don't want to make any false assumptions. Uh, where, where might I start looking? Where might I go? I mean, I usually recommend they get a reading first, you know, I mean, no, not with the online Babalawo, but if you have a neighborhood botanica and I feel like most places have a botanica mm -hmm. within, you know, a hundred miles or so. I even had, a, I was in, uh, Minnesota for Paginacon and he, a Babalao mm -hmm. showed up in the back of the room and just kept going, what'd she say? Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> so I feel like even if you're somewhere, I mean, I wouldn't have thought there was that much of an ATR presence in Minnesota, but there you go. There you, you know, go. so I think that like, you know, yeah, it might take driving a little bit. It might take a little bit of money out of your pocket, but go and get a reading. You know, if, if you sit down on the mat in front of the Babalao and they say, oh, okay, it looks like you're supposed to maybe get a rogacion or a head washing or maybe you're supposed you know then ask them if you're doing if they're doing any open ceremonies and be respectful and not have this you know i mentioned my priestess here people come in every day and go like what is voodoo i want to join i want to initiate I, after i get a reading then i'll be initiated right like no that's not how it works right 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 that's it. that's not how you would ask to join a family so no it's not it's not you know and i think that yeah, it might not be easy to find the open thing. It might not be easy to get a hold of somebody. It might not be easy to do that, but that's the right way to do it. You know, mm -hmm. if you just want to make it up, there's plenty of other things you could make up, but this is the way you do this. And, and, and the way you start is to get a reading. The way you start is to do your homework, do your research, just because it shows up across your newsfeed doesn't mean that's the thing for you. Like that's why 
it has to be in person. We have a concept called Ashe, which is the spiritual energy for things. You know, it, it everything has Ashe. You can't get somebody's Ashe online. Like you look like a very nice person, but I would <laughs> necessarily be like, oh yeah, she can come and join us. I saw her online. The same yeah. way that like, would you marry the person? Would you invite them to be your roommate? Would you invite them to spend the next 20, 30, 40 years of their life with you after just seeing them online for a little bit? Like, no, it doesn't work like that, you mm -hmm. know? And uh, some places have open things, but I think much more of it is closed again because of safety, because, you know, there, there's a lot of these traditions too, where it, it's really not supposed to be, you're supposed to have a side, this is supposed to be a side gig. It's not supposed to be, oh, I'm the big famous practitioner right. and I yeah. make $100,000 a year. No, 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 no. I'm supposed to have another source of income. So I'm not tempted to initiate somebody just because I need the light bill paid or just because I need this paid, you know, mm -hmm. like it has to be that this is a labor of love as opposed to a labor of work, because those are two totally different things. And, okay. you know, yeah. So if I if I am looking uh, perhaps to get a reading uh, and I, I want to learn more about uh, voodoo and, 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 and whether or not this is the right path for me and I want to take all the proper steps and I want to make sure that I'm doing that. It sounds like what I'm doing is I'm researching and I'm looking for a house and I'm going through whatever steps are required to physically get that reading. Can you maybe give me a couple of like red flag things to look out for if someone says yes i am a voodoo priestess and i have a house and you can come get a reading from me and well because this may be my first time ever even interacting with the practice on this level are there certain things that i can maybe know like okay a voodoo priestess would not do this in terms of getting to know a new initiate they would not say this they would not tell me to do that they would not ask this of me anything like that it's hard it's hard and this is going to get me in trouble too but i'm gonna say it um, <laughs> i mean i think that yes there are red flags in the sense of no there's no sex there's no sex anywhere there's none of that that stays as far apart from the traditions as possible so that's a big red flag right okay. there um i think if it, it's less of a you know um this person said something that was not right and more of a oh i googled this person and here they are in the new york times being involved in a murder i googled this person and and, and there's a major author out there that if you do google them that's what the deal is you know wow. here's somebody else who's been accused of rape five or six times who's another you know big player in the in the tradition you know so it's more like okay let me ask around what is this and i'm not saying so you before know, we even get Get to the like the magical stuff or the spiritual stuff oh like yeah. just the mundane things like google this person do a background check yeah you're gonna like physically go to their home like think things of that just like the mundane stuff oh yeah yeah even like when i was in new york once we had this really crappy botanica and <laughs> i would go in the other botanica every once in a while and i would just be like hey do you know those folks and they're like ah don't, you know like <laughs> right right reputation Sometimes yeah, patterns. yeah. So I mean, but it's not. And that was the other thing I wanted to mention, you know, maybe go take a Haitian dance class, see what the deal is there, talk to the dancers, talk to the drummers, but don't run in there with a giant sign, I want to learn voodoo, because they've heard it before. And they don't necessarily want to hear that, you right. know, but maybe once they get to know you, you can talk to them a little bit about what the practices are, you can talk to them a little bit about, oh, is there a voodoo house around here, that I might be able to go and witness, you know, and then once they know you're okay, then maybe they'll invite you to some of these things. Okay, and it sounds like like a big difference between voodoo and perhaps a practice like Wicca is the idea of like solitary practice or like self uh, dedications or initiations or things like that. It sounds like that's not really um, a factor in voodoo. If someone it, wants to be a voodoo practitioner and does not want to find a house, is that a thing? No, it's not a thing. Yeah. Um, there was some guy who tried to write a guide to self-initiation, and then he ran through the French Quarter, stabbed somebody, and I think he's still in jail. So <laughs> this, to me, it's like my <laughs> example or of it's oh. googling. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's not. I mean, and I think because it is so strong, because it does have a continuous lineage for thousands yeah. of years. You know, I could. 
my daughter went to restaurant school at Cornell, you know, Ivy League restaurant school. She came home, she showed me how to cut an onion. And I had been cutting an onion my whole life and I thought I knew the right way. And then it was like, uh -huh. ah. you know, it was like yeah. the, the, the light shone through the kitchen and it's on YouTube, everybody, in one of my cooking videos, if you okay, want to know how to cook it, cut yeah. an onion up <laughs> the right way. Yeah. But why make things more difficult for yourself? Yes, maybe. And I'm the shyest person out there. I don't like people. I don't like interacting with people. But this is the way it's done. So I have to get out of my comfort zone because this is the knowledge that I want. And by doing that, it won't be me making a mess of an onion and not having it be the right way. You know, right. like these people who want to make it up feel like little kids to me who go to make mud pies and they're like look at this delicious thing don't you want to eat it you can't really eat it because it's not really food and to be like that's great yeah, no these you. magical things you can't these magical things they do them that way for a reason and certain combinations are not just oh well i intuited this thing and this thing should go together maybe it'll work maybe it'll have horrible consequences you know my best friend and i like to say the best thing that could happen is nothing you yeah. know like yeah, that is always best case scenario yeah yeah you could call up something that really is unpleasant and then you're not equipped to deal with it mm -hmm. the same way that if you don't lock your door and you invite everybody in you could invite i watch a lot of true crime shows you could invite some maniac in or somebody you think is a friend is really not you know yeah <laughs> Yeah, those are legitimate dangers. And yes, I think it's it's on the one hand, it's easy to see the house structure and the initiation structure as like a bar to entry. Um, but I think when you really look at the purpose of it, you realize that it's not so much about keeping people out. It's about keeping the safety and the sanctity of the people who are within. And so I think why it is so hard difficult or I don't even know if the word's difficult but why it involves effort to be a come become a part of a voodoo house is because so much effort is being made to make sure that everyone inside is practicing and living in a way that is ultimately good for them and that is not going to endanger them in any way and so the barrier of protection is so that everyone on the inside is safe so it's, it's kind of like yes you may have to put more effort into a legitimate voodoo practice than perhaps something else but when you are there you can trust that you're going to be really held and supported and really protected and have wise teachings and elders around you to help you do things in a way that's effective but also safe and maybe minimizes the chances for mistakes um, or problems that you have to then have you know undo so. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. You know, I think it's like the difference of just, you know, trying to learn about something at your own library or going on the Internet. Then you have infinite resources. You know, I'm so proud of my God kids because now they've turned their lives into something that's beneficial for all of us. I'm not saying I picked them up out of the gutter or anything like that, although <laughs> some of them, they know where they were. But, <laughs> but you know, now that we, ha we have two that are nurses, we have one that's, you know, getting ready to go to law school. We have another that's a teacher, you know, yes, we all have spiritual knowledge, but then we have practical knowledge too. So I need to know something that's, you know, medical, I'll call one of the medical people. If I need to know one's, you know, works for a vet, I'll call them. Mm -hmm. If there's an animal problem, you know, it's that we can all work together as a family and that exponentially increases our resources, not just from a magical point of view. You know, I, one of them is, was in the national guard. So every time it was, don't drink the water, I would get the call right away. Don't drink the water. That because their call went out two hours before it went out to the rest of the city you right. know so it's things like that that like oh yeah it's a pain in my ass i gotta slap myself over there i gotta mm -hmm. do this that and the other thing but what are the benefits that i'm gonna be getting i'm gonna be safe i'm gonna be protected i'm gonna have resources that i'm not going to law school or nursing school but now i have resources yeah. <laughs> and i have to ask the question that always comes up um and that is about the the racial background of the seeker um, and and certainly folks who are not people of color in particular often have that question of can i learn about this can i go on this walk is this open to me whatsoever um, and so uh, is there something you can share with us about that in terms of uh, are there questions i need to ask about my racial background or ethnic background before I even begin this path and just say, hey, this is not for me? Or is the practice 
uh, African in origin, but not necessarily restricted to only African descendants. I mean, I think we've all seen that it's not completely restricted at all. And if people were asking themselves, should I learn about it? Think about how many of us were forced to, I was forced to learn European history. <laughs> I didn't get any African history at all. I didn't get right. Yala Santua, I didn't get Nzinga, I didn't get any of that, you know? So I think that people who are not necessarily black or people of color have a duty to themselves to educate themselves about this, not necessarily to run out and practice it and open up a store and write a book and all this nonsense, but they do have a duty to themselves to learn about it because the culture that we're in and forced all of us to learn about their stuff. So yeah. just to level the playing field, I they should really, run out and learn about it. Yeah, I, I, I'm sorry to cut you off. I just, I love that you say that so much. I wanted to take a, a moment to really focus on that because I've actually had little back and forth uh, in comments. I don't do a lot of back and forth in comments, but it, one day somebody piqued my interest um, because they made a comment um, on, on a post about one of your books. Uh, and a practitioner who has a platform online, she is white as far as I know, uh, was promoting, uh, I believe this was Voodoo and uh, the uh, African Traditional Religions book, um, which I believe was under a different name uh, yes. previously, uh, Voodoo and African Paganism. Yes. Uh, so if pe folks are looking for that book, it is now Voodoo and African Traditional Religions. And, uh, and, she, and she was just sharing her thoughts on it. And someone in the comments was like, this is not to be read by you. Um, and it's not to be read by people who aren't people yeah. of color. And of course, my first response, what, was, what I thought was funny, and I wanted to be petty because you were in the comments and you had said, oh, thanks for sharing my book, you know, thanks so much, something like that. And I wanted to be like, did you notice that the author is in the comments? <laughs> because this argument that you're making doesn't make a lot of sense. You know, her argument was, this is information that is only intended for people of color it's not for white people to learn about it's only it's closed off to them um, and I said well that doesn't make a lot of sense if uh, Lilith wants to make any money here because you know the we the books got to be sold where the books got to be sold and I don't think that was the idea so I'm really happy to hear you as an, an author and an educator on this point to say that like look initiation is another whole question but in terms of education we should all be learning about these practices and their history and how they've evolved over time and what they mean to people who are alive now um, and and be knowledgeable about that and that there's that's different from you know perhaps initiating or practicing something so I, I'm very happy to hear you say that everyone should be educating themselves and there is no racial bar to just learning about no these practices no and how many bad voodoo movies have they seen how many hours of their life have they spent consuming media that wrong told them information about, about voodoo. voodoo right at least educate yourself about perhaps more accurate information Yes, yes, because you're going to have that thing in your head. Now, like, do I have God kids that are white? Do I have God kids that are white presenting? Yes, I do. That's why I recommend getting a reading. I think anybody who's been in the tradition can very clearly see that there are people that are not black or not black presenting that practice the tradition. And because they belong to a family, because they belong to a house, those people have their back. They're there for those people and those people are responsible for them. So everybody should worry about their own self. And if they think they should move forward, get a reading, get a reading with me, get a reading with somebody else they trust and figure out how they're supposed to move forward. Yeah, got that. Good. You hear that, guys? <laughs> Um, I want to uh, start to get us towards the end of our time here, and uh, I want to make sure that people know where they can find you and about anything that you're working on coming up. So if folks want to know more about Lilith Dorsey or about any of the information that you can share, where might they go looking for you? Well, they can check my website, LilithDorsey.com. That has all my upcoming appearances, Hexfest. I think I'm going to be at Austin Pagan Pride. I'm going to be at Nashville Folk Magic Festival. I'm going to be all over the place come this fall. So that'll be great. They can check out my blog, Voodoo Universe. Just Google Voodoo Universe and you'll find that. And definitely don't forget to get the books. I'm so happy. Both of these books went, which way am I going? Up, down, around. Both of these books. <laughs> I'm like, I got nominated twice yes. for the best books of 2022 in the Cosmopolitan 
So I, I mean, it's just like, what? I'm a Cosmo girl now. <laughs> <laughs> that's a big deal. And that's a testament to how mainstream things are becoming, right? No, I know. And, you know, we see ast astrology reports and Harper's Bazaar and yes, uh, yes. articles about spirituality. And so that's really awesome. I think the New York Post recently had an article about the Instagram scamming that's going on um, oh, wow. with the spiritual community and stuff. So uh, it is really cool to see some of these mainstream uh, platforms actually caring enough to right. want to promote people who are uh, educated and, and truly involved in the practices. And, and that's that's a really big deal. So congratulations to you. And oh, thank I definitely you. encourage yeah, everyone to uh, please, you know, all of Lilith's information will be uh, in the intro to this episode as well as down in in the show notes and information. So I definitely encourage you guys to uh, get familiar with uh, all the knowledge that Lilith is putting out there into the world uh, because when we know better, we wish better. So thank you guys so much for being here and thank you Lilith for being here with me. Oh, thank you so much. This is lovely. Absolutely. Thank you witches for tuning in to another episode of the Better Witch Podcast presented by the Modern Witch Network. New episodes air every week. You can watch the video broadcast on YouTube every Tuesday at 7 p.m. or listen to the audio version on your favorite podcast platform every Thursday. And if you're a Bronx Witch Coven member, join us right after each YouTube broadcast for a live Q&A about the episode. Whether you're watching on YouTube or tuning in on your favorite podcast platform, we want to know your thoughts on today's episode. So please make sure to leave reviews and drop comments wherever you are. You can show support for this podcast by grabbing some sweet merch and join the Bronx Witch Coven on YouTube for behind the scenes footage from today's episode and the details to join in on those live Q&As. See you next week and blessed be. Mm -hmm.